So I, uh, I came across a, um, what I thought was funny at first, a story about the life and times of a youth pastor. It says, so I'm at Walmart returning 37 pool noodles because of youth ministry. And rather than explaining the whole story of why I'm a, a grown man returning 37 pool noodles, when asked, reason for return, I just said, the shopping list said noodles, but not what kind. Boy, was my wife mad when I got home. <laughs> Then I realized that's not very funny because that's a lie in the end. But hey, it was still funny. You know, last week I shared with you guys a story about when I was sitting in my car one day, shortly after I was a believer, my wife was questioning me about my spiritual progress. To which at first when she asked me, I thought one of two things. Either A, she's seen proof of that and I'm excited. Or B, she hasn't and I'm scared. <laughs> She said that she'd seen progress, but there was a couple areas of my life that she was still a little bit concerned about that dealt with, you know, the music I listened to and that dealt with some of the friends I still had and the places I went. And so I ended with this last time. I said, then how do I know how to know how to live for Christ? Where do I find those rich truths? To which she responded in God's word. I said, great, now how do I understand those? And she said, go see Chad. <laughs> I'm like, sure, that's an easy answer. No, I'm just joking. Listen, she's been a huge blessing. I'm in trouble for that one, but no, she has been. But her point was, I was seeing Chad already once a week. During that time, I need to say, Chad, how do I know then how to live these truths out? It was then that Chad even began to talk about more about the sufficiency of, in the supremacy of Christ. And as I thought about it this morning, it, it's not, the Christian life isn't saying I've got kind of my life and my desires over here. These are kind of like my files in, in, in Craig's life. And so I'm moving things over that I like. Church potluck because the food is good, Sunday night stuff because it's fun, things like that. By becoming a Christian, to say I'm taking my whole entire life and it's being transferred and it's now God's will, God's desires, God's plan, not mine where things fit in. And so I began to understand, okay, that's where the problem was. The disconnect was, I'm like, I'm a Christian and I like this part about it and I like this part about it and I like this part about it and the rest, I'm okay to live the way that I wanted to live. But that's not how the scripture calls us to live. As Chad, Chad talked about today, it is surrendering ourselves to Christ. I share that because today we start to talk about in Colossians, we talked about the mark of a true believer last week, and we're going to finish that. But today we start talking about the status of a true believer and what it looks like for those who are in Christ. You should have an outline there that on the front of it has what we'll finish this week, which was last week's, and on the back will be the beginning of what we'll start at the end of that today. What, we, what it was titled last week was the mark of a true believer. And the proposition statement was that as Christians, we must learn from the examples that both the Apostle Paul and the church of, in Colossae set for godly living. We talked about Paul's gratitude toward God for the Colossian salvation. We saw there, as you see those four things, biblical salvation is marked by four things. We talked about genuine faith. We talked about sacrificial love. We talked about eternal hope. And we talked about consistent obedience. We're going to move on today now and talk about number two, Paul's request to God for the Colossians' sanctification. You see, Paul now gets to this part of the letter, and he now moves on. He says, in light of the way that you're living, as we talked about last week, I don't want you to become content with where you are. Sometimes it's easy when we see growth to say, okay, good, I'm growing, I'm good. I see that I'm obeying in this way or I'm obeying in that way. But Paul says, my prayer for you is that you don't become content, but you grow in your salvation. It's what Peter talks about in 2 Peter 3, 18. He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. His desire is instead that they would grow in holiness. This is talking about progressive sanctification. It's that process of growing in Christ's likeness. It's where you say, okay, I'm seeing an increasing pattern of righteousness in areas of my life. 
I'm seeing growth in my life as a result of the Holy Spirit's work in me. And with that, I see a decreasing pattern of sin. And it's a lifelong process. This is what Jesus prayed for every believer in John 17, 17. He said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The means by which God has chosen for you and I to grow in sanctification is his holy word. Paul's heart for the Colossians here is the same that he had for the Thessalonians when he says to them in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 that he wants them to grow in sanctification. That is God's will is their sanctification. The text says that Paul has not ceased to pray for them regarding these requests. I just want to challenge you guys with Paul's heart here. I think it's easy for me to say, okay, I don't see any signs in this person's life of financial struggle or health struggles or relationship problems. They're doing good. There's other people over here that they're going through these things and it's screaming for my attention to pray for. But Paul's heart here is for their continued growth. That's my goal is that I would pray for all of us that way, the same way he did. And my goal for you is the same. We would pray for each other's growth in the spirit. We would pray for each other's growth and holiness, that we would pray that we would all walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. With that, the first thing we see either on your outline is that Paul has a genuine desire for their growth in biblical knowledge. Paul has a genuine desire for their growth in biblical knowledge. We started talking about this last week. Paul's first request to God is that he would fill the Colossians with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This word fill here is the word pluro, pluro, I think. It means to be completely filled or controlled. It is here that Paul desires that the Colossians would be filled to the top with biblical knowledge, that this biblical knowledge would control and would dominate their minds. The word for knowledge here is epinosis. It combines the normal Greek word of gnosis and has the added preposition of epi, which intensifies the meaning. The knowledge that Paul desires for the Colossians is to have a deep and thorough one. It is crucial for Christians to know the word of God so that they can know how to live for him. It is true that knowledge can puff up, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, but that is not the knowledge that Paul has in mind here. Paul doesn't desire for them to know the word of God to say, hey, I know the most about anybody else in the area. It is all about what I know. Paul is talking about having a knowledge of the word of God that is able to produce holy living. It's having a knowledge of God and of the word of God so that you know in your life how to please him. Proverbs 19.2 says also, it is not good for a person to be without knowledge. A lack of knowledge means a lack of understanding of the word of God and it's hard to apply what you don't know. When you know you're supposed to live out the Christian life, when you know that his word is filled with commands, it is hard to apply those if you haven't read them, haven't heard them. This spiritual wisdom and understanding that Paul talks about here refers to the ability to collect and concisely organize principles from Scripture. That's the wisdom part. And then applying those principles to everyday life. That's the understanding, knowing how to apply that wisdom. As we get into it, there are four reasons why he desires for the Colossians to have a deeper biblical knowledge. The first one we see there is because it produces spiritual obedience. Number one there is it produces spiritual obedience. Here in the first part of verse 10, Paul prays in our text. He says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
Paul prays they would grow in their knowledge and understanding of God's word so that they will know how to continue to grow in him. This is all throughout Paul's writings. Paul, or in Ephesians 4, 1, he says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Philippians 1, 27 He says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2.12. He says, so that you would, well, back up to 11, says, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul's heart, not just here, but for other, uh, other all Christians really, but other churches, would they would walk in a manner worthy of the calling of holiness to all of us, which we've been called. We talked about this last week. We are to live in a way that proves the transformation in us. We're to live that out. Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Be diligent, be diligent to present yourself, approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. The only way to know how to apply God's word accurately is to know it. The only way to live it out is to know it. It's reading it more and it's having a deeper knowledge and a deeper understanding of it so that you can, so it can produce spiritual obedience because the more you read it and the more you know about it and the more you know about God and about glorifying him in every area of your life leads to a life that can produce spiritual obedience if you apply those truths. Last week, we began to look also that Paul revisits it here. It was in the first part of his, his prayer. He also says he desires this knowledge so that they will bear fruit in every good work. It's not number two, it's, it's part of number one, that they would bear fruit in every good work. You know, there are two ways that someone can produce spiritual fruit. You first have to actually be a Christian because without the Holy Spirit in you, it's impossible to live a holy, sanctified life. You first must have the Holy Spirit in you to transform you. And then secondly, you have to know how to live that life to obey it. Biblical knowledge, when used for God's glory, produces spiritual obedience. Number two, I want us to see that because it produces spiritual growth. Because it produces spiritual growth. This is close to obedience, but carries a little bit different meaning. This refers to that progressing knowledge of God that leads to the obedience that we just talked about. Knowledge is crucial for spiritual growth. We know that. Peter makes this abundantly clear in 1 Peter 2.2. 2. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. As we're faithful to read God's word, the Holy Spirit humbles us to accept it, gives us a desire to obey, and opens our blind eyes to understand it so we can then apply it. It's through the reading of the word that conviction of sin happens and that realization of who we are and who God is and the life he's called us to live. This is part of that spiritual regeneration. We talked about it a little bit in Titus 3. We'll look at it again this week. Your desires, your focus, your goals have now changed. You now desire to read God's word in response to your life as you faithfully read it, you begin to understand 
who God is and his character versus who you are and your character. And as a result of those understandings, you now begin to grow in your obedience because you learn what God expects of you and how to truly please him. Growth in biblical knowledge produces spiritual growth. But I want to see number three, that because it produces spiritual strength. Because it produces spiritual strength. You know, it's in the word of God that we have the knowledge to know how to withstand the trials and challenges of everyday life. It's not talking about, spirit, about physical strength. It's not that, trust me, I, if that was the case, we'd all be in it all the time. Maybe, I don't know still. This is the strength that it takes to live boldly in the midst of persecution and temptation and to stand firm on the word of God in your life. It's the power that believers are strengthened by. That's the very limitless power of God that is manifested in all believers through the active ministry of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in Ephesians 6. through 17. Probably a familiar passage. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having, I'm sorry, therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. John MacArthur writes, quote, about being strong in the Lord. Ultimately, Satan's power over Christians is already broken and the great war is won through Christ's crucifixion and resurrection which forever conquered the power of sin and death. However, in life on earth, battles of temptation go on regularly. The Lord's power, the strength of his spirit, and the force of biblical truth are required for victory. The Lord's power, the strength of his spirit, and the force of biblical truth, or the full armor of God, are required for victory over the trials and temptations of life, end quote. Paul desires that the Colossians have a deep biblical knowledge so they can discern in their daily Christian walk, uh, they can dis have discernment in their daily Christian walk so that they know how not only to apply God's word, but to grow spiritually. This wisdom that we need to honor God in our lives each day comes through reading and understanding his word. He has a genuine desire for their growth in biblical knowledge because it produces spiritual strength. Lastly, we'll see from this is number four, because it produces spiritual endurance. Because it produces spiritual endurance. It's close to spiritual strength. You must first have spiritual strength in order to have spiritual endurance. You must continue to build your strength, to build your endurance. And Paul doesn't have in mind here, enduring the Christian life by just getting through it each day and simply checking off another day. Back on our text, he says in verse 11, he says, Strengthen with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Patience. 
This word steadfast in our verse means to be determined, immovable. It's to be firmly fixed in place. We must be determined to endure the trials and to live the Christian life with joy that is fixed on the amazing hope that whatever happens in our life, whatever happens in our life is for our good. It is for our good and it is for God's glory. It's Romans 8, 28. And we, we must remember that God uses those challenges and those trials to sanctify us and to change us, to grow us in Christ's likeness. James 1, 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise in glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The way to know how to endure this Christian life rightly is found in God's word. It's not just that we need to endure them. And we talked about it's for our own good. We're commanded to do so with joy. One commentator writes this, quote, knowledge of God's promises and purposes revealed in scripture gives the strength to endure trials and sufferings. You know, the way we do this is by continuously taking in and meditating upon and memorizing God's word. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, 9 through 16, says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told you of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. This endurance is needed to overcome trials and challenges day after day after day in our life. You know, one way to endure it patiently is to trust that he is sovereign over all things, that what he's doing, he's working out according to his perfect plan. We must trust in him because he is the one who is sovereign over all things in our life. Paul's desire was that this church in Colossae would have biblical, spiritual endurance. As we transition from that part now into the next part, 12 through 18, flip over on the back. We're going to start looking at today that we're going to look at the status of a true believer. And I'm sorry, Alden, I had to change the title because I, um, <laughs> Alden did put down the title, title I gave. And I asked my wife later, she said, that wasn't it. And I said, okay, I'm doomed now. <laughs> the status of a true believer redeemed through the all-sufficient Christ. We're going to start looking at today. Redeemed through the all-sufficient Christ. I want us to see that as Christians, we are redeemed by the eternal, all-sufficient Christ. The first thing we're going to look at there, number three, is Paul's gratitude toward God for every believer's salvation. Paul's gratitude toward God for every believer's salvation. As we get to this next part here, Paul is going to demonstrate his gratitude for every believer's salvation, recognizing it that is a result of the work of Christ. The first thing we're going to see, A, there, is that we were redeemed by the all-sufficient Christ. A, there, is that we were redeemed by the all-sufficient Christ. And as we break these verses down now in the 12 through 23, I really think what we see here in verse 12 is that we were given 
an eternal inheritance. Verse 12 there, number one on your, under A, is we were given an eternal inheritance. We know that God adopts us as his own. It's Ephesians 1, 5. It's John 1, 12 through 13. And part of that is the amazing truth that we now stand before God, redeemed and justified because he sent Jesus Christ, his only son, his only son on a rescue mission to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, 9 through 10. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. But that day he received salvation in that sycamore tree. Paul says here that a result of this work of Christ on our behalf is that God has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. This word qualified here. I'm going to get this wrong. I had it on my PowerPoint. I'm going to try it. Dennis, you can correct me. But this word qualified here is translated from the word hikanoo, H-I-K-A-N-O-O. It's that one. And it's used only here and in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians, in the NASB, it's translated adequate. It means to make sufficient to empower, to authorize, to make fit. Paul thanks God for the same reality that all of us should be amazed of. It's that God became our perfect substitute to fulfill what we couldn't. It's the truth of 1 John 2.2. 2. I love this passage. I love this verse. says in verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, Jesus himself, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Only Christ was made sufficient. Only Christ was adequate to accomplish our salvation on the cross in our place. Only he can make peace with God on our behalf. You know, all of us should never stop praising God for that amazing truth. I, I think about why do I become comfortable with the amazing truth that when I didn't deserve it, couldn't accomplish it, God sent his son to accomplish that very thing which was eternal life, which was salvation for those who repent and believe. We were made justified. We were qualified to share in this inheritance, not by our efforts or work, but we were redeemed and qualified only by the all-sufficient work of Christ on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21. What exactly is this inheritance? Really, it's two things. The first is eternal life. This first inheritance he's talking about is eternal life. We know of this amazing truth that all of us who believed in Christ as Lord and Savior, we've already received it. It's our status as a believer. It's not something we're getting later. It doesn't say you've been saved, now later on in life you're going to get eternal life. It's that we have it already now. 1 John 5:13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. But this inheritance also speaks, speaks of the earth, as Jesus himself talks about in Matthew 5.5. 5. And it refers to the future truth that we're gonna, we will rule with Christ in the millennial kingdom. As John talks about in Revelation 20, 
verse 6. This is true of all of us who are sitting here today who repented of our sins and have believed or confessed that Jesus is Lord. It's finished because Christ himself is all sufficient. It's finished because Christ died on the cross for our sins. It was placed on the cross on Christ and it's finished because of his perfect work, his redeeming work on the cross. And it's for the saints in light to those who have believed. As we move on, I want us to see number two, that we were given eternal deliverance. Number two is we were given eternal deliverance. Here in verses 13 and 14, back in our text. He says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This amazing reality speaks of the new birth. Because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, we are delivered, we are rescued from the bondage and slavery of sin and being an enemy of God. Romans 5, 8 through 10 Paul writes, but God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were enemies, which we are, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans 6, 5 through 7 says, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. This word domain could be translated power, jurisdiction, or authority. And one writer writes that it refers to the supernatural forces of Satan. Every unbeliever, every unbeliever before salvation is held captive in this domain of darkness. And if you sit here today unredeemed, you haven't repented, you still remain in that same domain of darkness, not transferred over by Christ. But for those who have believed, we are now part of the new birth and are a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Titus 3, 3 through 7. We talked about it a little bit earlier. I actually want to read it this time. says, for we also once were foolish ourselves, all of us, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But the amazing truth, starting in verse 4, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is because, as it says in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. As believers in Christ, because of his death on the cross, we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and been transferred then to the kingdom of his beloved son. This is amazing to me. You know, God didn't just pull us out of darkness temporarily and say, okay, I saved you this time. I got you this time. You're good. And then set us on our way. 
He then transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We were delivered. It's a done deal. And we're transferred into his kingdom. It's a done deal. And in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know, kids, I was thinking to get you involved here. The cartoon shows they have the superhero that comes in and just saves the day and picks up the person that's about to be hit by a train and places them back on the side of the road, then vanishes into thin air. And you wonder, what happened to him? What did they do? Where'd they go? Jesus says, this isn't how Jesus is. He rescues us from the danger that we're in, and then he transfers us into his kingdom. He forgives us of our sins. He redeems us, and he makes us new, and he has a personal relationship with us. This kingdom in the context speaks of the spiritual reality now. In Romans 14, 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, which all believers have now. You know, this act of redemption should cause us to never take lightly what Christ accomplished for us. This word redemption means to deliver by payment of a ransom. It was used to speak of freeing slaves from bondage. For the New Testament believer, it speaks of Christ freeing us from slavery to sin, as we've already looked at. It's Ephesians 1.7. It's 1 Corinthians 1.30. It's a beautiful passage in Romans 3 where Paul writes this. I love this passage. This, is, this, this covers it all. It says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be both just and and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Wow. Paul was grateful in prayer toward God for his amazing redemption through Christ. That's a reality for Paul. That was a reality for the Colossians in our passage. And if we're a believer today, guess what? It's also a reality for us. Next week, when we come back and finish this up, we're going to start on number four, Paul's exposition of the all-sufficient Christ, where we look through now how Paul describes for us who this amazing Savior is. And we're going to look at what we do now, both as a believer and an unbeliever, because 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, I'm going to end with this. says, and actually I'm going to go back to 20. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently one another, love one another from the heart. For you have been born again not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is to the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever, and is the word which was preached to you. As a result of the word being living, living and active in us, there's a way he's called us now to live. We're going to look at that next week. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your word, that it shows us your glory.
We thank you that it shows us Christ. We thank you for the amazing truth that although we were sinners, enemies of you, rejecting you in our everyday life, that you came, that you sent your son on a rescue mission to seek and to save that which was lost. And that those, only those who repent of their sins and, and confess you as Lord, who believe in the Son of God as their only Savior, their only propitiation, their only payment for their sin, their only substitute, they will have eternal life. It's a promise. I pray that as we go out this week that that's the hope that we would share with others. That this amazing God who has transformed us and given us that hope can give them hope as well. That we would magnify your name in all that we do. And I pray this in Christ's name, amen.